Hello guys. So in this session, we are going to deal with a topic of sclera and that is your scleritis. So my main purpose here is that you get to know certain uh, details about the anatomy of sclera and also we'll get to know how we can differentiate between anterior scleritis and posterior scleritis and what are the important things that you should know with respect to it. So let's get started. So I'll start first with the anatomy of the sclera. Now this everybody knows that I has got three coats or three tunics. We have the outer coat that is your fibrous coat, then we have a middle coat that is your vascular coat and then we have a inner coat that is your nervous coat. So here we are talking about the fibrous coat of the eyeball. This is the outermost coat of the eyeball and this can be divided into two parts. What are the two parts? It can be divided into anterior one sixth part as well as the posterior five sixth part. So this anterior one sixth will be your cornea and this posterior five sixth will be the sclera. So in this way we are dealing with this posterior part of the fibrous coat of the eyeball. Can you see this blue arrow? So this blue, so they are dividing whole of the eyeball into six parts. Now out of these six parts anterior one sixth is your cornea and posterior five sixth is the sclera. Is that very clear? Right. Now what is happening? This sclera is also covered. So the outer surface of the sclera, if I talk about the posterior part of the sclera, in the posterior part it is covered by a capsule called as tenon's capsule. Is this clear? And the anterior part. Now the anterior part, can you see the white portion of the eye? So that is actually covered by the conjunctiva. So this anterior part of the eyeball that is your outer coat sclera is covered by the bulbar conjunctiva, right? So what is sclera? Then uh, the coats of the eyeball, then your division, your anterior one sixth posterior 5 6 and then we have the surfaces which are covered outer surface by the tenon's capsule and your anterior surface by the bulbar conjunctiva okay now if you see the relation of this sclera with respect to the other coats so if you go by the outermost area so because you know uh, I always draw this outermost area with the black so this is your sclera here then we have the red area red area will be your uh, choroid and then we have got even inner to that this is your uh, retina right so we are here concerned with this sclera. So that means because you know sclera is external to the choroid. So that means suppose this is uh, the sclera. Okay. So this is your outer surface of the sclera and this will be your inner surface of the sclera. So obviously the inner surface of the sclera is in contact with the choroid and there is a space between them. This is called as suprachoroidal space right that i like you study the subretinal space also so that subretinal space lies between the rpe layer and the neurosensory retina similarly we have a space between the choroid and the sclera this is called as the suprachoroidal space okay now, an important component here is the canal of Schlem. Now, you must be remembering this canal of Schlem we always talk about with respect to the aqueous drainage also. When we read the trabecular pathway. So, in this uh, trabecular outflow system, in the trabecular outflow system, it was starting with the trabecular meshwork, right? 
and if you remember uh, what happens the maximum resistance to the flow of the aqueous humor is provided by which part of the uh, trabecular meshwork it is called as juxta canalicular juxta canalicular juxta means near so that part of the sclera which is near the canal which canal the schlem's canal which is near the schlem's canal is actually providing the maximum resistance so where actually lies this canal of schlem it is lying in the anterior most part it is lying in the anterior most part near the limbus in a pharo so if you look here if you look here the structure so can you get this see these are the layers of the cornea here and this is your uh, suppose this is your cornea and this is your sclera so this portion is actually the limbus so there is a furrow which is near the limbus and in that furrow is lying the canal of schlem lined by endothelial cells it is oval in shape and it is allowing the drainage of the aqueous humor right now we come to the thickness of the sclera now this is an important point and many questions are being asked on this thickness of the sclera now first of all if you compare the thickness of the sclera with respect to the age that is children and adults and if you compare the gender wise the male and the female you will get to know two important things it is actually thinner in children and in cases of of the females it is thinner so it is thicker in adults it is thicker in males second important thing and this is a very very commonly asked question where it is thickest it is thickest posteriorly now don't get confused with the thickness of the lens capsule the thickness of the lens capsule is thinnest at the posterior pole so they are going poles apart the thickness of the posterior capsule is uh, this lens capsule is thinnest at the posterior pole while the thickness of the sclera is thickest posteriorly and how much it is it is 1 mm then what is happening Happening gradually, it is becoming thinner, thinner, thinner. And what is happening as it reaches anteriorly? Now, do you remember what it does anteriorly? Because you people read so much of squint, yes, and I have shared so many videos on the extracellular muscles. So, what do we study there? If this is your eyeball. okay and this portion is your cornea and this is pupil so this means this is your limbus yes or no and this is your sclera and this is your cornea so what is happening anteriorly anteriorly we have got the extra ocular muscles which are inserting into the sclera so that means obviously where muscles are coming the thickness is decreasing and that is why the thickness is thin minimum just posterior to the insertion of the extracellular muscles they even play with these words also anterior to the insertion of extracellular muscles at the insertion of extracellular muscles and posterior to the insertion of extracellular muscles so it is the posterior to the insertion of the extraocular muscles where we have got the thinnest okay then we have the lamina cribrosa lamina cribrosa is actually a sieve like uh, structure uh, if you remember i always uh, mention this lamina uh, cribrosa in the glaucoma when we study glaucoma we have got a sign called as what lamina laminar dot sign we always mention about the laminar dot sign so what is laminar dot sign that is seen at the level of lamina cribrosa now lamina cribrosa means if i talk about the eyeball okay so that part of the sclera through which the optic nerve fibers are coming out how many fibers do optic nerve has optic nerve one optic nerve has 1.2 million exons 1.2 million exons it 
contains so when one optic nerve contains 1.2 million axons these many fibers are piercing the sclera and coming out so if i look at this portion uh, this portion of the sclera it will be cribriform so i if i see the cut section of this area something like this then i am going to get multiple Multiple circular areas piercing this clara here like this, this, this so that you are having a sieve like appearance. You are having a sieve like appearance there something like this. So this is actually called as lamina. Cribrosa. This is called as lamina cribrosa. Lamina means the layer, so layer of the sclera, which is cribriform, that is your sieve like, is called as lamina cribrosa and it is actually showing this laminar dot sign. What happens in the glaucoma? They become elongated. So instead of this, they become elongated and slit like and they also become visible up to the optic disc margin normally they are not visible but in cases of glaucoma they become distended and elongated up to the optic disc margin this is called as laminar dot sign so due to this laminar dot sign the lamina cribrosa is very very important now we will be talking about the apertures of the sclera apertures of the sclera we have divided these apertures into anterior middle and posterior we have got three kind of apertures we have anterior we have middle and then we have the posterior one now through the anterior what are the things which are passing through the anterior we have got the anterior ciliary vessels middle is very very important why i am saying very important these are the vortex veins now do you remember when we study the malignant melanoma whenever we study the drainage what is happening the tumors are actually causing compression of these vortex veins and because of the compression of the vortex veins the aqueous humor is not able to drain properly so what is happening raised intraocular pressure now can you correlate why do all we always have a glaucometer stage in the tumors we have a glaucometer stage in the tumors because they are causing the compression of these four vortex veins very very important then we come to the third one now third is your posterior what are the things which are passing posteriorly through the sclera one very important thing that we have uh, seen just now is your optic nerve and then we have long and short ciliary nerves so anterior say so you can easily remember anterior for anterior anterior ciliary vessels middle say we have got the four vortex veins and through the posterior everybody knows the optic nerve so what is left is your long and short ciliary nerves so if you see this with the help of a diagram can you see through anterior uh, we have got the anterior vessels that is arteries and the veins now nerves are left they will be going posteriorly and we also have the optic nerve posteriorly and what is there in the center in the center we have got the vortex veins and these vortex veins are actually going how they are going like this they are supranasal infranasal suprotemporal and infratemporal so they are causing compression of all of the cavity uh, so the, whenever there is a compression of uh, these veins in the cavity what is happening there will be decrease in the aqueous outflow and therefore it will lead to the glaucoma okay now coming to the layers of the sclera now i always get one question ma'am how to identify whether it is episcleritis or scleritis so see this is answer to all of your questions we can divide the sclera into three parts we have episclera 
then we have sclera which is also called a sclera proper and then we have the lamina fuchsia. Now what is happening actually what is episclera? Episclera is nothing but it is the connective tissue. So over the sclera proper we have a dense uh, uh, tissue, a layer of the tissue which is also vascularized. It contains a fibroblast, macrophages and lymphocytes. So obviously it is a uh, great potential where the inflammation can take place and that is why many a times uh, we get the congestion and we feel like it is a conjunctivitis but actually it, it is not, it is not showing you discharge, it is not um, uh, being benefited by the antibiotics then ma'am what it is, it is episcleritis, scleritis and episcleritis, now episcleritis is much more common than scleritis and it is less severe, scleritis will occur less commonly but it is mu much more severe. Okay, then talking about the sclera proper. Now, the sclera proper is again a avascular structure and it is a very dense tissue because it is giving you tensile strength. When I talk about the fibrous coat, the main thing I am emphasizing is the tensile strength of that tissue. It is providing you the strength. So, dense bundles of the collagen fibers are there and it is a avascular tissue. It is providing its strength and then we have the lemma. Fuchsia. This is your innermost layer which is actually blending with the supracoroidal as well as the supraciliary. I showed you what is supracoroidal space and they are actually fusing with these layers of the uveal tract. It is brownish in color. So basically when you see the brownish layer in the sclera, it is actually the lamina fuchsia and why it is brownish because of the presence of the pigmented cells, because of the pigmented cells. Then coming to the inflammations of the sclera. Now in the sclera we have got two potential sites of inflammation episclera and sclera proper. So if it is superficial it is epi, epi means above and if it is properly deep then it is the scleritis. Okay, so let's see first the episcleritis. So in the episcleritis, the inflammation is taking place just in the superficial layer. So we have the inflammation of the episclera. Now literally everybody can tell that episcleritis means inflammation of episclera but it is benign and recurrent. Now this is very very important. Many a times you must have seen that uh, patients come having lot of inflammation which does not look like to be a conjunctivitis. They do not give you any history of discharge that is not uh, reacting properly to the antibiotics and you give the steroids they are improving and then after some time again they are coming. So this is a tendency of episcleritis. It is a benign condition but the problem is it is a recurrent condition. It involves the overlying tenens capsule. This is also involving the tenens capsule and it but but uh, important thing is it is not un involving the sclera. So episcleritis there is a good thing about it that it does not involve the sclera because if it will involve the sclera obviously it will go into more and more uh, severe condition. Now look at the etiologies of the episcleritis. So why we are interested in etiologies because you know it is a recurrent condition. So what should we think if the patient is again and again coming with the episcleritis you should think about gout psoriasis and rosacea. Hypersensitivity reaction to even to the tubercular and streptococcal toxins can also be leading to episcleritis. So if, if any patient comes to you having recurrent episodes of episcleritis, think in terms of these also uh, according to the age, according to environmental conditions, according to the past history, according to the septic foci, whatever are the evidences given you have to think according to these. Now the incidence, now this condition is more common in males, especially the young males. So a typical patient is somewhat similar to that of the VKC spring catar, a young male. Now why I am telling you this, I want you to make a clinical acumen because now from now on the most of the questions that will be coming in your exam 
PGME exam, be it any exam, uh, NEET, next exam, they will be your uh, clinical scenarios. Now, they can be comprehension, they can be analysis, problem solving type, but they are clinical. Okay, I, I think I am I am very very clear and next uh, uh, they I have shown you the glimpse of that in the NEET 2020 paper uh, recently the FMG exam on 31st of August they did got so many of the clinical scenarios. So that means now from now on they want you to develop that clinical acumen they don't want just the dummy doctors they want you to become very very good doctors and what is the um, like trademark of a good doctor his mind should always be thinking in a clinical way what what can be there so if a young male is coming to me uh, what should I think about I uh, I can think about the allergic conjunctivitis I can also think about this episcleritis are you getting this now what is the pathology so we have the inflammation what is the basic pathology of inflammation that will be applying here also so we have the localized lymphocytic infl infiltration or in which tissue the episcleral tissue and as I told you that it is involving the overlying tenens capsule but not the underlying sclera and that is why you can get the edema and the congestion uh, not only in the tenens capsule but also in the conjunctiva because the anterior portion of the sclera is also covered with the bulbar conjunctiva. Now the symptoms. Symptoms are simple. We have redness, we have burning, we have gritty sensation, we have foreign body sensation. Now these things are very very general and you are getting these kind of sensations in the allergic conjunctivitis also. Okay, so you have to be very very precise. So, uh, when it is episcleritis, when it is scleritis, when it is VKC and when it is pelectinular keratoconjunctivitis, when it can be just a foreign body, when it can be a viral conjunctivitis. So, there are some symptoms which are occurring in every other problem in the eye, especially conjunctivitis, scleritis. So, you have to be um, very, very ad um, vigilant about the thing which is actually a catchy point, which will help you in making the diagnosis. Don't rely on redness, discomfort and sensation because this will be present in all of them okay so what are these things so first you have to understand that this episcleritis is of two types we have diffuse episcleritis and we have nodular episcleritis now as the name indicates in the diffuse episcleritis whole of the eye is involved and the maximum inflammation but though the whole of the eye is involved, maximum inflammation is found only in one or two quadrants. While if you see the nodular episcleritis, here you get a nodule. So it can be a pink or a purple nodule that is there and that is surrounded by the injection. Uh, can you see this? You are getting a nodule. This is your nodule and you are getting this uh, peripheral injection right and if you see here here we have got the diffuse kind now though you are not able to see here and here so one or two quadrants can also be there but a typical nodule is not formed that is also a diffuse episcleritis now this nodule that you are getting this will be a firm nodule tender and the overlying conjunctiva moves freely the overlying conjunctiva is moving freely that these are the things that you have to check when you are checking or uh, examining a case of episcleritis. Now coming to the clinical course. Now the clinical course is a limited. The best part of this is that it is resolving spontaneously. It is benign. It is resolving spontaneously but it is recurrent. It is a condition which is not very very serious. Right. Recurrences are common. It can occur in bouts also. Then a thing is called as episcleritis periodica. So there is nothing uh, much specific. Periodica. It is reoccurring periodically. A fleeting type of disease. So many a times what happens. The patient becomes restless. Every time it is coming and reoccurring and reoccurring. And they, they become uh, like fussy. That what is happening again and again. So that is a episcleritis periodica. That is occurring in them. So what are the things that you can think of. 
while you are doing or seeing a case of episcleritis. First is the inflamed pingicula. What is pingicula? It is the elastotic degeneration of the substantia propria leading to the yellowish discoloration. So, in that case, we have just the yellowish discoloration of the nasal uh, conjunctiva and uh, the apex is away from the cornea. So, um, in itself this pingicula is uh, asymptomatic, it does not cause any symptoms, it is not um, uh, the issue for the treatment, just we treat uh, in cases of the uh, cosmesis problem. But if it is getting inflamed, then it is called as the pingiculitis. So this uh, pingiculitis can give you a similar picture as the episcleritis. Then the second is the scleritis. So uh, though the scleritis picture will be much more severe, we will be saying, but at a glance it can be looking simulating the episcleritis and then we can also have a foreign body reaction. Suppose there is a foreign body embedded in the bulbar conjunctiva and uh, all around that uh, foreign body we are getting lot of inflammation. So that gives the picture of nodular episcleritis. Now coming to the treatment. So what should we give? Now though it is um, resolving spontaneously after a certain period, but the treatment is important because uh, why should a patient suffer from 7 to 10 days from so much of pain, grittiness, foreign body sensation, so many things are there. So what we can do, we can give topical corticosteroids. We can give the steroid eye drops and you have to give very very frequently every 2 to 3 hours. Every 2 to 3 hours we have to give then the cold compresses. Cold compresses are applied to the closed lids. Uh, whenever we have got lot of inflammation we can give the cold compresses there. We can give the uh, steroid eye drops. Now you have to understand the difference between the hot fermentation and the cold compresses. In cases of the eyelid infections, in cases of sty, in cases of internal hordulum, in cases of um, what you called as um, the scalazion, we were giving the hot fermentation but here we have to give the cold compresses. Then along with this you can give the systemic drugs also, the anisids. We are giving the ibuprofen, intomethacine, uh, then we have got this uh, fluoroprofibin also, these drops are also available that you can also use oxyphene butazone. So, because you know uh, somewhere the systemic drugs are also required because it is involving with the systemic disease also. Now we come to the scleritis. Now let us see what is happening here. In the scleritis we have the inflammation of the sclera proper. Now the important thing is that though the episcleritis was more common in the young males, this scleritis is common in elderly females. So look at the age and gender of the patient. So I think this will again give you an edge to distinguish whether it is a episcleritis or it is a scleritis. Now let us see the etiologies. There are so many etiologies which have been defined for the scleritis. We have autoimmune disorders, we have metabolic disorders, we have so many infections, we have granulomatous diseases, then there are so many miscellaneous conditions. Surgically it can be induced and idiopathic. Now what are the important things about it? First of all the most common thing. So most common association that you have to remember is your rheumatoid arthritis, a commonly asked question. Along with this vaginous granulomatosis, polyarthritis nodosa, SLE, ankylosing spondylitis. Now these will help you in the all except MCQ. So be prepared for both. They can ask you a direct MCQ most commonly associated and they can also ask you all except question. Now second important thing, what are the metabolic conditions which are frequent? So if suppose I am having a patient of gout and then I, I, I know already that this patient can have episcleritis. So this can be a gout, thyrotoxicosis, again a common condition in middle age or elderly female. Now there are certain infections which are also related with episcleritis. If you remember herpes zoster of thalmicus. Now herpes zoster of thalmicus can cause inflammation in every part of the eye. So herpes zoster of thalmicus will also 
Solito, Episcleritis and always remember staph and strep are real enemies and every time the infection is being talked about, they are there, staph and strep. Now coming to the granulomatous diseases. Now, um, you have already seen a video on the eye in the leprosy and I have talked so much about it. So, uh, certainly when uh, there is ocular complications in these granulomatous diseases, whether it is syphilis, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, so we have got uh, Henson's disease, so many granulomatous diseases, episcleritis remains an important implication. Miscellaneous conditions, these are there uh, where episcleritis is not the most important aspect, but you can find there. So, sometimes it will help you in ruling out the other things. So, we can have the radiations, we can have chemical burns, we have the Wachtkoe and Aggie Harida syndrome, VK8 syndrome, um, uh, then we have the Bechet's disease, Rosacea. Now, these two, uh, we have got VKH and uh, Bechet's are important because we do read them in cases of of uveitis. When we read this in uveitis, there are there are certain conditions where uveitis is actually associated with the systemic diseases. What do you get in VKH? We get C O N E cone. This is your mnemonic. What is this cone? That is we are getting the cutaneous uh, involvement, then we are getting the ocular involvement. Then we are getting the neurological involvement and E for ear, otological involvement is also there. So, in this we are getting the episcleritis, Bechet's may, we are getting the triad, we have uh, the oral ulcers, the genital ulcers and then we have uveitis. Surgically, surgically, if you are doing any surgery within 6 months, you can have episcleritis. Now, this is again very important because if you think about the persons who have undergone cataract surgery, um, especially the elderly males and females and then they are repeating repeatedly coming that something is uh, like irritating and we are looking at the suture, it is not there, we have removed the sutures, what is happening that is actually episcleritis because even the surgical trauma can cause episcleritis and then we do not know so many uh, times that what is the cause of episcleritis and that is your idiopathic. Now looking at the pathology, so that is very simple, we have lot of uh, inflammatory cells, polymorphonuclear lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages, lot of fibrinoid necrosis and basically it is destroying the collagen which is present in the episclera and because you know it is more commonly found in the granulomatous diseases, so what you are going to find is the granuloma which is surrounded by the epithelioid cells or the giant sense. Now coming to the classification of scleritis. So we can broadly classify the scleritis into anterior scleritis and the posterior scleritis. Now can you see the proportions anterior scleritis 98 percent and uh, posterior scleritis is just 2 percent. So in 98 percent of the cases we are having the anterior scleritis, just 2 percent of the people is having the posterior scleritis. So that means when a question comes in front of you and you are thinking about the scleritis, your first instinct should be to diagnose it anterior scleritis and not the posterior scleritis. I am not saying that even if you are getting direct signs and symptoms of posterior scleritis and then also you will say that it is anterior scleritis, no. But can you imagine it is just 2 percent. So, suppose it is not very very clear that which kind of scleritis it is, then it is better to choose the anterior scleritis than the posterior one. Okay. Now, this anterior scleritis can again be divided into non-necrotizing and necrotizing. Necrotizing means ulceration. So, non in the non-necrotizing, we have same as that of the episcleritis. One can be diffuse and another can be nodular. But in the necrotizing, we have got one where we have the inflammation and one where we do not have the inflammation without the inflammation. Now, the one which is without the inflammation, there it is called as scleritis. Malaysia performance. So, this is again an important term, remember this. Okay. Now, see here, the anterior scleritis, posterior scleritis. So, it is the anterior scleritis which is more common. Then in the anterior scleritis, we have non-necrotizing and necrotizing. Now, again see the ratio, 85 percent is non-necrotizing. So, this is actually more common. So, that means it is the non-necrotizing type of anterior scleritis which is more common in comparison to the posterior scleritis.
Now coming to the symptoms. Now this is a condition which is much more severe in cases of, uh, than in comparison to the episcleritis. So here I will have moderate to severe pain, very very deep boring pain the patient will have. Even the pain is so much that the patient will wake up early in the morning due to that pain. It is radiating to the jaw area, the temple area. <coughs> then they there can be redness also it can be diffuse it can be localized depending upon whether it is uh, nodular or it is diffuse then the patient will have photophobia watering redness all these things are there now though the pain is there in episcleritis and scleritis both you always have to remember that the deep pain the boring pain with uh, due to which the patient is not able to sleep will be very very unlikely episcleritis then your diagnosis is going more and more uh, in favor of scleritis and even if you look at the eye the scleritis eye which will be will be more and more severe more uh, see will be giving more and more severe look in comparison to the episcleritis now see this so we take the non necrotizing anterior diffuse this is your most common kind of scleritis non necrotizing anterior diffuse this is the commonest one this is showing you widespread inflammation a quadrant or more and the area is raised salmon pink or purple in color so when you see this kind of scleritis it will be something like this of very very diffuse scleritis and uh, it will be looking like an acute red eye and uh, because of these vessels it is giving you pink or purple uh, color salmon pink color like appearance in the eye while if you see the nodular now this is actually a localized um, uh, thing which is having the same characteristics as that of the diffuse the difference is that these findings are now localized so you are getting one or two scleral nodules there and usually they are located near the limbus so sometimes uh, we may confuse them with the nodular keratoconjunctivitis that is your filictinular keratoconjunctivitis uh, but if you see it properly take the proper history then you'll get to know that it is the nodular scleritis and these nodules are actually arranged in a ring near the limbus so uh, it is called as a nodular ring scleritis here they have given you a single picture like in cases of filictinular keratoconjunctivitis you will get a single filictin okay and that will be leading to the ulceration so we have fascicular ulcers we have got uh, miliary ulcers we have got uh, sacrophullous ulcers but here we are having multiple nodules arranged at the uh, limbus this is called as annular scleritis then we come to the now necrotizing necrotizing first we are taking with inflammation now this is really really severe kind of scleritis where we have anterior scleritis we have lot of inflammation lot of ulceration and uh, this uh, area is also actually characterized by vasculitis so the vessels are also involved and because the vessels are also involved you will have the infarction now you already know the pathology if there is infarction the area of necrosis will be there dead tissue will be there and therefore there will be thinning so what is happening sclera becomes like dead transparent and ectatic and what will happen the uveal tissue will start shining from it so this is your staphyloma this can be leading to the staphyloma so uh, when you know this you will get to know how we will actually have these staphylomas what is the reason of staphylomas and what kind of staphyloma you will have in scleritis we will be having a, a separate video on the scleritis there there we will be talking about each type of staphyloma also then we talk about the anterior necrotizing without inflammation which is called as scleromalacia perforans now this is actually found in the patients where we have long standing rheumatoid arthritis now can you see this the most common association of the scleritis was was with the rheumatoid arthritis the most common type of scleritis is your anterior scleritis which is non necrotizing and diffuse but the one which is related with the rheumatoid arthritis is the anterior necrotizing 
So here we have necrotizing patch, yellowish patch is present at the melting sclera and uh, what is happening the overlying episclera and the conjunctiva they are a kind of uh, completely separating because that area is really really ulcerated okay. So um, though the perforation is rare here but the thinning of the sclera is again taking place here okay. Now let us see the posterior scleritis. Posterior scleritis means the inflammation of the sclera which is lying behind the equator and this is frequently misdiagnosed. So uh, you know anterior scleritis diagnosis is not that challenging but the posterior scleritis diagnosis is quite challenging. It is associated with the inflammation of the adjacent uh, structures. So, there are certain things which are related with it like we have the exudative retinal detachment, we can have macular edema, proptosis and also limitation of the ocular movements. So, very typical thing that you get in cases of the posterior scleritis, this is your B scan. On the B scan that is a B scan ultrasound, you get a typical T sign, you get a typical T sign in the posterior scleritis. Now, what is this T actually? See, when you see the T, what is happening? This arm is formed by this optic nerve. This is formed by the optic nerve here and this is by the fluid which is collecting in cases of the posterior scleritis. So, this is your um, what you called as the uh, this um, uh, long arm and this uh, horizontal arm is actually formed by this optic nerve. This is called as typical T sign. So, nowadays when they are asking you more and more image based questions, even there also they can give you this. Okay, now coming to the complications. Now, what all complications can take place here? Now, because of the inflammation, there can be collection of the inflammatory cells. So, we can have glaucoma, we can have the cataract also, the complicated cataract. Then we can have sclerosing keratitis. Now, if it is uh, taking place at a very, very high level, even we can have the sclerosing keratitis. The corneal involvement can also take place. But all uh, obviously, this is taking place after a long time, not uh, 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 in a very early phase. And even the keratolysis, like we were having the uh, keratomalacia, uh, this uh, sclerosmalacia uh, perforance. Similarly, in the later stages, even the corneal perforation or keratolysis can take place. So, these are the investigations. Uh, there is a long list of investigations because there is a long list of the um, diseases which can be associated with it. So, you are doing uh, starting with the basic one TLC, DLC, ESR, then you have to look at the immunity levels because you know autoimmune uh, diseases are also related with it. Rheumatoid arthritis is the commonest one. So, you have to do the rheumatoid factor also. Then you are doing like uh, things for the VDRL, then you are checking for the gout also do the urine analysis also, tuberculosis, leprosy, look at the uh, x-ray chest for ruling out so many things here. Then you have to see whether there is any foreign body or not and how to treat it. So, how to go about the treatment for the non-necrotizing, we can give the steroid eye drops. At the most, if you require the systemic treatment, you can give indomethacine. Now, for the necrotizing, because here the necrotizing kind of scleritis is present, so topical steroids will not be sufficient. You have to give the heavy doses of oral steroids also and if they are not responding, one may have to give even the methotrexate and cyclophosphamide, so immunosuppressive agents. Subconj, now this is very, very important and I think this could be asked as a question also. The subconjunctival steroids are strictly, strictly contraindicated because they may lead to the scleral thinning and the perforation. So, this is a very important point that you have to give the steroids. You have to give the steroids but do not give the subconjunctival because scleral thinning and perforation 
session can take place. So I hope you enjoyed this session, get to know certain important details about the anatomy of the sclera, the openings of the sclera, uh, how to differentiate between the episcleritis and scleritis, what are the clinical features and how we can treat the respective conditions. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.